All right, so this video is by a special request from my buddy Abel Tabarez, really, really good drummer. He asked me, hey, could you show me a little bit about how to mix drums? I'm trying to get better at that. So to start things off, um, I'm gonna show you where we're beginning and where things ended up and all the steps I took to get there. So anyway, check it out. So here's the process. Here's what I'm going to do, right? Um, the first thing is I load in stems and I just balance levels and get some basic panning straight, right? I just want to be able to hear everything before I really get in and balance it. But So I want to hear the kick-snare relationship. Um, I want to hear what's going on with the cymbals. Um, I'll generally pan the toms apart. Um, so I have, I guess this is my rack tom, pan way over as well as my floor tom. Then I also did some stuff with samples, but we'll get into that in a second. Um, and then I normally will take my overheads and send them to some kind of group or bus so I can control them together and affect them together. And then the individual overhead tracks, I'm gonna pan apart, usually in the neighborhood of like 20 to 50%, depending on how wide we can go. Um, I would recommend going to 100% each side just to see what that sounds like. Um, and then all the variations in between, right? So, and then I take all my drums and I will bust them together through a single group um, or single bus. So again, I can process the whole drum kit together. So that's step one, is just rough level and panning. The second step I would recommend, um, at least in this kind of recording where there's a lot of bleed, I'll give you an example of that. Let's go to the snare. Um, in this case, Abel has like all kinds of cool ghost notes and an embellishment happening on the snare that I didn't want to lose. So I wasn't going to be able to completely gate it out. Um, but I was trying to just separate the drum sound from the cymbal sound as much as possible. So here's what that sounds like. Not perfect, but I think that sounds a lot cleaner than this. And if that sounds a little too choppy, remember that we also have sound from the overheads to blend in with that. Um, my concern here is if I don't gate it and then I start to put EQ this brighter and compress it and stuff, it's just gonna make the symbols really, really in your face. So we want to avoid that if possible. Um, and th at least in this kind of scenario where the recording like is, you know, we're working with what we got. Um, so anyway, after gating everything, um, the next thing I usually like to do is get some EQ and compression going on. Um, usually how I think about EQing is you want to do all the cleanup work first. So get rid of problems first. And then if you want to add in stuff to create a vibe or push things further, then that's when you do that. But you gotta you gotta do the cleanup work first. So um, let me just show you an example of that. I was complaining about this kick a second ago. So for the kick, here's how I EQ'd it. Um, I call it, this is like the race car, right? So I'm uh, rolling off a lot of the high end. Um, I'm reducing a lot of the mid range and trying to accentuate this bump we get in the bottom around like 50, yeah, 40, 50 hertz. All right. And I'm going to play this all in context in a second. So it's darker, but we're getting more pump, which is nice. And then I have a compressor on here. This is just like the waves comp, nothing special. You can use whatever you got. Um, and how I like to set this up is I set an attack of, what is this, 52 milliseconds? Yeah. So the idea is we want to let the front of the note through and then squeeze on the back of it to fatten it up a little bit. Um, and our, yeah, the ratio is what, maybe five, six? Yeah, about five. So 
I think the compressor just helps it sound a little rounder, which is what I like a kick to sound like. Now let's do the snare. The snare is a little different. Um, so in the case of the snare drum, I'm using the sculptor thing, which is kind of like, um, it's like a, a responsive EQ that you can use to add character or reduce resonances, but it's gonna move around. Um, so let me just play this so you can hear what it's doing. It's like a, a responsive EQ that you can use to add character or reduce resonances, but it's gonna move around. Um, so let me just play this. Again, gated pretty aggressively. You see how this adds some high-end color? Not perfect, but it is helping us to hear a lot of those ghost notes, which I really didn't want to lose. So that was cool. Um, then as far as the EQ on the snare drum, um, I'm jumping the low end because I want to make room for the kick. And then there's a little bump right around the fundamental of the drum. You see it? Oh, actually, you know what? This should be a little higher. My bad. And a little roll off in the highs. Maybe we need this. The more the more of this we add around 1K, the more like papery it sounds. So I'm trying to be kind of gentle with that. But I, again, I do want to keep those ghost notes. Um, and then finally, some excitation. little different on the highs and lows. Again, that's for the sake of just brightening it up so we get the crispiness of those, those ghost notes in there. We don't want to lose those. Um, and then I'll show you what I did on the toms quickly. All right, toms. This is the floor tom. Similar thing, we're rolling off high end. Right, a little dip in the, the low mids where things get muddy, and then a bump on the fundamental. A little transient shape to help the pop at the front of the note. The same trick, a little excitation. Um, but again, I, this, I'm not sure how successful this was. I guess it's, it's really dark without that, but so okay, we'll, we'll keep it. Um, and then just some compression to keep the levels similar. Um, the first compressor, again, slower attack time, kind of like what I did with the kick. Um, not quite as slow as the kick, but still enough to let that transient through the front. Similar ratio, a little higher, right? And then this is just catching the peaks of stuff. A little faster attack to tighten it up. So you see how the threshold's higher? Here it's a little bit lower. Um, generally, I, I like to compress like this. I like to do it in, uh, in steps. All right, you might think that this tom is a little dark, and it is. Um, it's because I did not really like the character of the tom that much. Also, the, again, a lot of bleed, a lot of the symbols in there. So what I did is I darkened it up um, to keep some of the tom's color in there, and then I layered in samples to, to help augment that. Um, so anyway, I did pretty much the same thing with the rack tom, so we'll skip that. But anyway, let's talk about the overheads. These sounded a little papery, and I was hearing some resonances in the symbols that were bugging me. Let me find a big symbol moment. Uh, maybe in here. Yeah, again, kind of papery. A lot of rings. That I don't find to be musical. So I'm just EQing out some of the problem frequencies. That's mostly what's happening here. Like if we listen to this, we're just ringing, right? And it's kind of standing out from what's around it. And also this frequency range from about 2K to 5K. This tends to be a problem spot in general because our ears are more sensitive in this range. And I talk about this all the time. And um, there's a lot of instruments that have kind of they have information in that space 
so things tend to build up there between the sensitivity thing um, as well as the fact that just lots of stuff is competing for that area. Um, if you want to check out the Fletcher Munson curve, that's a cool um, explanation of why. It's basically because that range has a lot of speech information. So our ears are adapted to be more sensitive there. Um, but anyway, yeah, so here there's some dynamic EQ. Again, because I was just getting some problems here, but only on certain cymbal crashes. So basically with this dynamic EQ, these are like little baby compressors that only reduce when a threshold is exceeded. Whereas these are just EQ curves, right? Um, and how I find the problem frequencies, right? is I take a band, I'll go fairly narrow, and then I just listen at the listen button. Or if you don't have that feature on your EQ, you can just boost it and slide around until the problem gets worse. That's when you know you, you found your problem frequency. So just come through here, I'll show both ways. You hear them in here, it's like it's a little louder out of nowhere. You also want to listen for stuff that's just ringing. It's not, so in other words, you can't hear the connection between what's happening musically. Um, so I, I will listen with the solo thing, or you just do this and slide it around until the problem you're hearing gets worse. Like here really sounds rough to me. So once I find that problem spot where it really sounds worse, you just take this and flip the gain, right? And then uh, then it should be better. But I've already done that, so I'm not gonna double down. The other thing I did is, let me put this back at 100. Um, that was the original EQ curve I got. Um, and it sounded like a little bit much. So I just reduced the scale. A lot of EQs have this kind of feature. Um, if you don't, you just, it's fine. You just highlight your bands and back it off. Um, I'll do this by ear. All right, next problem though. Uh, when you do this, sometimes things start to thin out a little bit. So I'm using a tape emulation plugin to put highs back in that are a little bit more musical. Now, out of context, I, I used this tape emulation and dialed it in because there's a, a high boost thing here. This might sound kind of bright on its own, but let me play you this in context, then it might make more sense. Right, so um, in the context of the track, I actually like this a little brighter. Um, so that's why I wanted to push in some of those highs again. Um, I was just wanted like an airier thing, not that like ringing in that, that two to three K-ish range that was happening. Oh, I forgot one thing um, on the snare drum. Eleven seventy six, all buttons in trying to get more smack out of the snare drum if you like if you want to get a certain sound a certain smack to a snare like this is the plugin or this is the box originally it was a box but now it's a plugin right um yeah but slow attack fast release all buttons in this sounds great you could play around with the attack time depending on how smooshed you want it to be. Right, I like the, the, the slowest time sounded the best to me. Hear it in context. Here it is without. All right, 
so now bus processing. Um, so in other words, processing all the drums together. Um, so first thing I did, this is a mid-side EQ. So the idea of mid-side is you have some information that's common to both speakers, and then there's some information that's different in both speakers, right? So instead of right side, left side, you could think the mono component and then the stereo component of the sound. Um, often, you don't need much low and low mid presence in the stereo field. You want that to be narrower. It sounds better that way. Same thing in the super high region, like 10K, 20K. Um, having stereo action happening there isn't, or like big difference in stereo field, doesn't always sound great. So what I'm doing is I'm EQing out lows and some low mids, extending up in the low mid range, as well as some high end, but I'm only taking it out of the sides. I'm only, right, and then I'm, I have a little expander happening here in the high end of the mid, so the center channel, right? I think it sounds a little tighter with this kind of EQ in play. Now on the drum bus, I usually do some kind of transient shaping. Now the fun stuff. Um, usually on drums, some kind of saturation is helpful to just um, just help them hit hard. You know, so this is a cool plugin. Uh, Black Box by Analog Design. You can get it from Brainworks, these guys. Um, so I'm adding in a bunch of saturation and then mixing in at 50% wet dry. Now I'm gonna put it on 100% so you can hear how saturated it actually is. So then that's, that's, I like to push the saturation a little bit for like further than what sounds good. And then just mix, mix in a little bit of that. So let me take it down to 50% and you could probably hear the difference. adds a little bit more bite to stuff. So some kind of saturation just helps the drums hit hard. Um, also, what, one thing that I've seen done is if this is making the cymbals too aggressive, you might only do this to your your drums, your round drums, kicks, snares, toms. Um, and then you, cause a plugin like this, like this tape emulation is gonna add some distortion, right? So that's just another option. Um, now, Pultec EQ. So I'm, I'm boosting super low and then also rolling the attenuation up to shift the resonance up a little bit more. Uh, and then also boosting, bo same trick up top. We're boosting the highs super high at 20. Uh, or excuse me, the highs are at uh, 8, right? We're boosting, so everything above 8K. Um, and then we're attenuating from 20 just to roll off the super highs. Um, cause in the track, there's some stuff up there that I didn't want to crowd out. Um, so anyway, and then finally this API 2500, it's super fast, great drum compressor. I would play around anywhere from 0.03 as fast as it goes to one millisecond just to tighten it up.
And the release time, I like to be fast. So it has, if there's like a snare drum hit or something that makes it compress, I like to make sure that there's time for the compressor to recover all the way and uh, before the next note happens, that's gonna trigger. Oh, one more thing. Um, I am sending my snare and some of my samples and a little bit of overhead into a reverb bus, a reverb effects bus. I'm using a plate reverb, this one's quite good. Um, so let me toggle this on and off a little bit. So after playing with levels a little bit with this guy, um, I wasn't nuts about how the toms and the snare drum were sitting in the context of the mix. This, this is a little different in every DAW, but how I would look up, or what I would look up is um, drum replacement in your DAW, whatever it is you like to use. Um, like I said, this is Reaper. Um, that's a whole other video on how to do drum replacement, but basically what I did in the case of like the rack tom, for example, um, there's some ghost notes here where I'm using the original track, but I also wanted like the the bigger hits to be just super clean, be able to reverb only those um, and push them up a little louder. Um, and also have something that was a little bit more dead or a little bit less ring for those moments. So what I went in and did is whenever we had one of those, like here and here are good examples, I went in and replaced, or not replaced, but layered in a sample to help give that drum hit some more punch and some more excitement. So if we listen here, right, also you hear it's kind of dark. You hear some bleed, that's not great. Right? But if we add this in, all right, let's hear it. Huge, right? Way bigger. Um, and it's, this is just recorded a little bit better. So I'm not all out replacing. Um, I it, I like the performance and there's some things I don't wanna lose. There's like some little rolls and stuff, but I want certain hits to just hit harder. Um, and I could only push things so far. There's some problems with um, like some weird resonance in the room or, or the tuning of the drum, I'm not sure. Um, so this floor tom, right? That sounds like shit on its own. It sounds super mechanical, but when you mix it in with the original, it's a little bit better. Oops, back it up. It's still kind of crazy, actually. I put it in with the other tom, the rack tom. Right, that's a little bit better. And then finally, if you put this in with the overheads, let's just do all the drums so you can hear it together. Sounds huge, sounds so much better, right? Whereas if we take those out. Sounds kind of thin. I hear a lot of room sound, especially in the floor tom, which isn't lovely. Um, but again, just a little light replacement. Then of course, we gotta hear this in context, because that's really what counts. Even if, if you don't like the drum solo, you know, like if it works in the mix, it works in the mix. Um, this is usually the last phase is like I go in and automate depending on what's happening in the, the track. All right. That's better. This I would probably take out. Um, is here the, the machine gun sample replacement? Ah, uh, not great. Ah, uh, <laughs> oh, let's hear the whole thing. So 
So to fix this, this is a good problem to check out. So I did the sample replacement and I have these like machine gun 16th notes that are just not great. So let's do this, excuse me. Oh. That's better, that's much nicer. Anyway, that's it. Let me know if you got questions, concerns, comments. Peace.